Good morning. Welcome home to Trinity, a place of sharing the gospel and growing God's family. Before we get into uh, today's service, we're going to watch this month's Wells Connection. Hello, I'm Pastor Keith Free, the administrator of Home Missions. A church is a communion and a community, and people want community. A place where people know you, where everyone cares about your well-being. For a new mission congregation, knowing how to create this kind of community is vital, as the pastor and members look to tell more people about Jesus Christ. Castle Rock, Colorado is growing. It's been repeatedly listed as one of the best places in America to live. And that means new families are arriving here almost every day. That sets up an ideal situation for a mission church, as young families in transition look to put down roots. We were new to the neighborhood, new to the area. We just walked in some Sunday morning and were just greeted with uh, open arms, um, down-to-earth people, and just a very welcoming community feel. Yeah, you don't have a meter checker, do you? Our Wells mission here is Eternal Rock Lutheran Church, led by Pastor Jared Oldenburg. Like most young missions, this group does not yet have a church building. Instead, they worship in a rented space each week. But that hasn't slowed the work. So I thought, you know, with my husband, I said, let's just try it. Let's see what this all entails. And we came and we love it and we love serving and we just, we love everything about this church. Building a mission congregation is often a long road. Reverend Oldenburg arrived here seven years ago with three resources, the Word of God, his family, and the support of Wells. In the early days, it's especially helpful for a mission pastor to know he has the encouragement of Wells members everywhere as we all walk together. There's a lot of times where you feel completely alone. For me personally, there's a lot of encouragement to know that there is a, there's a group of people that is not just rooting for you, there's a group of people that are praying for you and they want your mission to do well. Each home mission begins by working to understand the unique features and needs of its community and then finding the best opportunities to share the gospel. In Castle Rock, one thing young families are looking for is personal connections, opportunities for authentic relationships. I think more and more when you talk about themes of authenticity and community, People want a place where they can feel like these are my friends. They can go there and say, I know this person, I know that person. And, and the way that you do that is through shared experience. One way this congregation built a shared experience was here at the local movie theater as they screened the new movie, Martin Luther, A Return to Grace. The festive atmosphere brought people together for fellowship, fun, and a deeper understanding of the Lutheran church. So thankful that all of you are here and I'm excited for a great night. So we're gonna get started up in just a minute or two. I cannot and I will not retract anything. The film, oh man, it was just so well done to know that Christians don't rely on how good they are. That's probably the biggest takeaway for me. God has forgiven it all. It was a very good movie to, I'm sure for people that already know about Martin Luther and for people that don't know anything like me. It's just a great opportunity to see other families, see other kids, um, and just kind of have that social interaction with them outside of church. Screening the new Luther movie is just one of dozens of ways this mission church is building community and strengthening relationships. There are seminars on marriage and parenting. Yes, Thomas, go the miracle. Kids camps on art and music, service projects, and of course, Bible classes. All those efforts are in support of the congregation's primary goal, preaching the word and administering the sacraments to as many people as possible. How does our home missions decide where to plant new missions in order to tell more people about Jesus? 
Often that process starts with people like you. Wells members see opportunities and pass information to their district mission board. The boards then follow up on those ideas. By God's grace, since 2013, more than 30 new home missions have started where connections with the Lord becomes the most important community. To learn more about home missions, visit wells.net. So in the video, it talked about that new Luther movie. I don't know if you know about this, but our Synod was basically a co-producer of that movie along with um, PBS, Public Broadcasting Stations. And um, it is available to um, be seen in theaters like they did there. It will also be on um, PBS later this fall. And yes, we are looking at a hosting a showing at a local movie theater right near us. We're looking at the date of September 21st. That's tentative right now, but uh, keep that uh, in your radar. And when you hear more about it, it would be great to have an entire movie theater full of, uh, of Trinity people and guests as we look at that movie. Today is a um, special day. It is Trinity Sunday, not about our church, but about our triune God that he is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first scripture reading for Trinity Sunday is always Genesis chapter 1, the, the creation account, and I'll talk more about that later. But what we're going to do then, because we're looking at creation, we're going to use this to, to start a sermon series, a one, well, a type of series that we've tried to do every year, one based on a part of the catechism. This is, begins a series looking at the Apostles' Creed, hence the bulletin cover, I Believe. So today we look at, I believe that God made it all. Our opening hymn for today, hymn 193, Come Now, Almighty King. May God bless you as you worship him today. We follow the order of worship in the service folder. Please stand for worship. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship Him. Our first scripture reading is from the very page, opening page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. It's the creation account. This will also be the sermon text for today. Now, as, as we go through this, there aren't, I guess, direct references to the Trinity, but there are certainly allusions to God being three in one. See if you can pick them out. Since this is such a long reading and such an uh, important part of the Bible, there will also be a visual presentation during the reading. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and then let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. 
And God saw that was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God sent them in the expanse of the sky to give light to the earth, to, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the waters teem according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas. And let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures who move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image. In our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all he had made. And it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of our Lord. Let's respond in glorifying God with Psalm 150. Psalm 150 is on page 122 in the hymnal.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Here we definitely have a very clear example of the Trinity. This is Matthew chapter 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This is God's Word. We join in singing hymn 177. Please be seated for that. Brothers and sisters of God's family, the Apostles' Creed begins very simply, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so today we're going to go back to literally the beginning, the first page of the Bible. And it's one of those days where um, you're going to need the Pew Bible and and follow along, very easy, Genesis chapter 1, literally page 1 here. God creating the, the, the heavens and the earth. This is actually even in one of our stained glass windows. The very first one over here on the left, it, it looks like this. And what, what the stained glass window is trying to capture is very simply what we believe. God made it all. So let's take a look. Genesis chapter 1. 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Three things just uh, from those verses there. In the beginning. I don't know if we always think of it this way, but God created time. So it's a, mind, a little mind-boggling here, but, but God exists outside of time. He, he's not controlled by time. He controls time. So he created time itself. Second thing, notice um, who is hovering over things. The Holy Spirit. Like, like I said, today is Trinity Sunday. And here is this illusion, more than a hint, that God is more. That, that there's Father, Son, and, and here Holy Spirit. Now, normally we say, we ascribe God the Father as the one that created, but obviously the Holy Spirit's involved. If you jump ahead, way ahead to, Gen, uh, to John chapter 1, you see very clearly Jesus was also involved at creation. So we actually see the Trinity here in a little bit. And then, third thing, notice how it describes things. Um, formless and empty. The, the original Hebrew words for this is tohu vabohu. And they, they have the idea of, of being empty, without form. There's nothing. When God created the world, there was nothing. It was just Him. And then, verse 3. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there's evening and there's morning the first day. So, so this first day, God created light. Now, th this is a little interesting because there's no source of light yet. He created light itself. But it kind of makes sense because you think of uh, some of those stars out at night, some of the way far away stars. If God didn't create the light between the star and us, we'd never actually be able to see the stars because it takes so long for that light to travel here. So, so day one, God created light, and then, of course, the absence of light, he created darkness. Look at day two, verse six. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. So on the second day, God separated things, and you have the waters above and the waters and the earth below. Now, it seems a little odd to us, right? We don't really think of water up above. But here's an interesting fact. In the atmosphere, there's 37.5 million billion gallons of water, clouds. So day two, God created the separation of earth and sky. Day three, God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees, and the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds, and it was so. So, so on this day, he um, created land and, and the seas, and, and then the first type of life, vegetation. But there was a limitation on this vegetation. It was to reproduce, but there was a limit on that reproduction things didn't reproduce into a different kind of plant. Apple trees reproduce into apple trees, each according to their kind. So on day three, you have land, sea, and then vegetation. Then day four. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. 
God made two greater light, great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Now, we could spend so much time just on these verses alone. But first of all, notice, why did God create the sun, the moon, and the stars? It wasn't for us to learn our future or have our fortune told. It was to mark the passage of time. And let's talk about these stars God created. If you look up at night and you're away from Chicago, okay, away from the city lights, and you look up and you're actually able to count all the stars, you could count maybe a few thousand stars at night. Now, if there's no moon and you have perfect eyesight, that actually jumps up to about 9,000 stars. If you have really good binoculars, you could see 200,000 stars. If you have really good telescope, that jumps up to um, 50 million stars. And... Um, that's not all. Of course, the bigger the telescope, the, the stronger it is, the further we see and the more stars we can find. So, so right now, the estimate is that there's 10 trillion galaxies and each galaxy has billions of stars in it. God created all of that. Day four, the sun, the moon, the stars. Day 5, verse 20. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the waters teem according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So, you know, we would call this, uh, he, he made the, the fish and, and the birds. Well, a few things. You know, I talked about the, the creatures in the water teeming. The, the Hebrew word actually has the idea of gliding. So you can think of the, the big sea creatures, like the whales, just smoothly gliding through the water. And, and then the word that's translated birds for us it, it's more than that. It's anything that flies. So it's the birds, but also flying insects. And here's just some numbers for you with that. There are 950,000 species of insects that fly. Every year we, we discover 10,000 new species of insects like that. Of the, the creatures that, that are marine life, there's over 2 million species we've discovered. Of birds, there's over 10,000 species of birds. All those amazingly beautiful and different animals, that's what God created on day five. So, birds and fish. Then, day six. Verse 24. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So here God created uh, creatures, animals on the land. And there, there are kind of three categories. He talked about the 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 livestock, the, the Hebrew word here is the idea of, of animals that can be tamed or domesticated. So, your cat, your, your dog, uh, farm animals. Then there's also the wild animals, those are the ones that can't be tamed, lions, tigers, bears. And then those that, that move along the ground, and the Hebrew word here is, is a little hard to translate, but it's the idea uh, of being right there at ground level. So, lizards, snakes, um, the insects, the, the spiders, the bugs like that, even worms in the ground. Animals like that. All, all these things God created on day six. But that's not all. Verse 26. Then God said, 
Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created humans, people. Now the language used here really shows that, that, that humans, that this was something special. This was the crown, that the height of God's creation. And notice something else. Did you catch what God said? Let us make man in our image. Who's us? Here's that allusion again to the Trinity, right? God's talking to himself. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Triune God. And then another thing to note. He gave humans a job to rule over, to, to take care of this world he had created. Now one more thing, and this is really brought out in the next chapter of the Bible, a lot more, but just simply here, on this day, God also created marriage. The, the foundation of human society. For the animals, uh, reproduction was by instinct. For people, it was by a union by marriage, by choice. So day six, God created land animals and, of course, people. Then day seven, which is actually turning the page, chapter two. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he had rested from all the work of creating that he had done. One important note here. When we think of the word rest, we think of taking a nap or taking a break because we've been working so hard, we, we, need, we need a break. The Hebrew word translated as rest here does not have that idea. It's not like God had been so exhausted from his creating work, he had to take a nap. No, the Hebrew word simply means he stopped. He ceased doing it because he was done. There was nothing more to do. So on that seventh day was a day of rest. Now, as we look at this, there are so many things that we, we can focus on and look at and learn, but there's still one last key important question here about creation itself, and that's how did God do this? Well, one of the common phrases that came up every day was, and God said, and then it was so. How did God create everything? With his word. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing, right? I would love Chicago stuffed pizza and an ice-cold Mountain Dew. And there it is. <laughs> that would be amazing. That's the power God has. And that's why in Psalm 33 it says this, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. So, as we look at creation then, there are still some important things we need to look at. One thing is the idea of the day. Now, if you notice, you know, every uh, day of the creation there, there's this phrase that kept repeating, and there was evening and there was morning, the first day, the second day, and so on. Now, that, that can seem a little odd to us, because as we view a day, you know, it's, it's a 24-hour period. We divide it into two 12 hours, uh, you know, morning and afternoon or evening, a.m. and p.m., but in the Old Testament Jewish way of thinking, it wasn't exactly like that for them. For them, the, the day ended at sundown. And that's also then when the new day began. So uh, for an Old Testament believer, t uh, tonight when the sun sets around 8.30, that's the end of Sunday and, and then Monday begins. Now this plays in actually on Good Friday. You remember that Jesus and those two disciples were on the crosses and, and the, the Jews didn't want them still hanging up there on the Sabbath, which began at sundown later Friday. And so they, they had the, the legs of those criminals broken to, to speed up 
the process of dying. They came to Jesus. He already was dead, and that's why they, they stabbed him with a spear to make sure. Well, how's this playing on creation? What, what God is doing is, is making very clear what he means by day. There's evening, there's morning. It's the Jewish way of saying this was a regular 24-hour day. God, by his power, the power of his word, created everything in six 24-hour days. Now that brings up something else, doesn't it? Evolution. Now, now maybe this is the first time you're visiting Trinity and you're, you're thinking, I don't know about this creation thing. Or, or maybe this is just something you've always personally struggled with these first few pages of the Bible. Or maybe you've never been really confident or comfortable Confessing, expressing your faith in God creating the world. Well, we're going to compare creation and evolution, and hopefully this, this will help you. There are a lot of ways we can do this, but I'm just going to look at three things today. Chance, design, and information. I'll begin by simply stating, okay, let's be honest. Evolution does make sense. The, the idea that, that little changes over a lot of years add up to big changes, that, that makes sense to our human reason. But let's also be honest. Evolution is all based on chance, on, on accident. The, the idea that, that things just happen purely by chance. You know, the, the idea of evolution is, is that there are a bunch of chemicals. And, and just by chance, purely on accident, all the right chemicals in the right proportion, in the right order came together, and poof, you, you have a, a, a protein. And then they say, well, eventually there are 2,000 of these special proteins, and purely by chance, by accident, they all came together in the right way, and, and poof, there, there you have a single living bacteria. Well, mathematicians, you know, numbers people, have actually figured out the probability of evolution happening. They say that the chance of, of the right chemicals coming together in the right way to form a protein is 1 in 10, and that 10 is followed by 520 zeros. Now, you know, winning the lottery, if you get all the right numbers correctly, six numbers in a row, the chance of winning that is 1 in 14 million. million has six zeros. This is 520 zeros. Now that's just for the protein to form. They say then you have 2,000 of these proteins coming together in just the right way and just by chance forming that single bacteria. The chance of that is 1 in 10 followed by 40,000 zeros. That's not even a number we can comprehend. And so back in the 1980s, there was an astronomer by the name of Sir Frederick Hoyle. He and a mathematician friend figured this out, and they put it into a term that, that maybe we can understand a lot better than 40,000 zeros. They said it's the same odds of a tornado going through a, a junkyard and picking up all that junk and putting together a fully functioning 747 jet airliner. Like I said, Let's be honest. Evolution is based on purely chance. Accident. That's chance. Let's talk about design. Um, get out your cell phones. I actually left mine at home this morning. <laughs> get out your cell phones. I want you to look at the cell phone. Get them out. Now, for some of us, we remember what was before smartphones, right? I don't know what you call it, dumb phones or whatever. But, but smartphones today are amazing. Look at that phone and think about what it does. And really, we hardly use it for calling, don't we? There's so much more. The, the apps that, that you can have. I, I have on my phone an app so I can tune my violin. I have a metronome so I can have a, a, a timing. Um, my brother-in-law has an app. I have no idea how this works to find studs in the wall. 
Think of all that, that our phones do. The design put in it. Is there any way that that phone could, could come into being completely by chance over millions or billions of years? The, the, the screen, the, the, the metals inside, the, the battery, the recharging capability, the apps. And the design of our phones is nothing compared to this. Well, let's talk about information. What makes you biologically unique and different? It's our DNA, right? Our DNA is in every cell and it is microscopic. But do you know how much information is actually contained in our DNA? It's been compared to the, the equivalent of information in a thousand books. And I'm not talking little books. If you ever read The, the Catching Fire or, or the, the, any popular books, they're this thick. Thousands of those, a thousand books like that. Given enough time, millions, billions of years, there is no way that a book would be written all by itself, let alone a thousand books. Like I said, let's be honest. Evolution says it all happened by accident, by chance. Let's also... Be honest. The bottom line is this. It takes faith to believe in creation. It takes faith to believe in evolution, doesn't it? The Bible says in Hebrews, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I believe what the Bible says because God has convinced me of that. It's a matter of faith. I don't always completely understand it, but it is what I believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, now some people have tried to, to kind of combine that, that, that God created the world, but he used evolution to do it. <laughs> You've got to go back to what the Bible says. That phrase kept coming back at, after every day of creation, right? And it was good. And after the last day, it was very good. Evolution says things start out really small and simple and then eventually got more complex and, and better. Creation says just the opposite. When God made it, it was perfect. It was great. If anything, because of the fall into sin, it, it's gotten worse. Creation and evolution are, are just not compatible. By faith. God, God has convinced me, I believe, God the Father made the heavens and the earth. So what does this mean for us then? Well, God gave Adam and Eve a job, right? To rule and to take care of the world. He's given us the same job. To take care of it. But how good do we do that? Here's a very old picture called a Tasmanian tiger. There's no color picture in existence because the animal no longer exists. Similar to a Tasmanian devil, but the Tasmanian tiger has been hunted into extinction. Is that taking care of God's creation? No. Or think about your fridge at home. You know, every, every time I go shopping and for groceries and you come back, I, I have to first clean out the fridge of all the old stuff so there's room for the new. And there's always that food that somehow got pushed back, those leftovers in the back of the fridge that you, you need to throw away. Is that taking care of the things God has given us? No. God has given us this body. Did, are we all in great fit and, and shape? Do we all have a great diet and take care of this body? No. Do we always give God the glory, the credit for what He did in creating this world? We take it so for granted, don't we? And yet God gave Adam and Eve, He gave you and me the job 
to take care of this creation. That's exactly why Jesus came, isn't it? God, the Creator, became one of us, a creation. He, Jesus was a human. And he went to die on that cross. It shows just the extent of God's love for us, His creation. He, he sacrificed everything for us. Jesus died on the cross for all the times we don't take care of His creation like we should. He died for every sin. So that not only we could enjoy this world, but actually we could enjoy a better world. So that He would take us to heaven. That is the extent of God's love for us. So, so what do we do then? Take care of the world God has given us. Enjoy it and give God the credit for it. You know, we could spend a lot of time looking more and more at, at, at what God did in the first seven days of time. But let's just simply leave it at this. God made it all. But that's not all He did. Next week we're also going to see it at how God didn't just create this world and leave it alone. He, he actually takes care of us. He provides for us every day. We'll look at that next week. But for right now, for today, we know, we believe, God made it all. Amen. Please stand. Let's join in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed, but it's in a question and answer format on page 8 of your service folder. In a world of confusion about where we come from and who it is that provides and cares for us day by day, what do you believe? Many in the world think that God isn't concerned about our pain and suffering. Some feel that they can solve their own problems. Others feel there is no hope. What do you believe God has done for you? Many people believe that faith is the one work they have to perform to come to God. Many fear death. What comfort can you give to them that would help them through their struggles? Please be seated for our next hymn.
Let us honor our Creator with our offerings. Please stand for prayer. Lord God Almighty, you are the creator of all things, and so we ask for your blessings upon Justin Bloomer, who is Margie and Ken Biesterfeld's great nephew. Justin has been diagnosed with a very dangerous and aggressive form of brain cancer. We also ask for your blessings on Juanita Wasman, who is in the hospital undergoing testing and Bill Paul as he is in the hospital recovering from surgery. Lord, keep these your people in your care and not only bless them as you have through this world but continue blessing them providing all that they need day after day. And Lord, hear us as we join together in the prayer you have taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Because we're running a little long today, for our last hymn, we're only going to sing the first verse of hymn 481. Please be seated.
Good morning again. Just a few quick announcements. Um, reminder, the ILS golf outing is this coming Saturday. If you notice a lot of chairs in the hallway as you, throughout the ministry center, um, either you know what they're there for because you've had your picture taken for the directory, or you will know because you'll be here for a picture directory. And if you've not done your, made your appointment for pictures, please be sure to do that. Um, the time is rapidly running out. So call the church office or just go to the church website and you can sign up that way. And then um, at 9.30, we don't have a Bible class, but we are privileged to have a presentation by Christopher Johns, um, who will be very shortly ordained and installed as a pastor, and he's going to give a presentation on his first call in Pound, Wisconsin. That will be in the fellowship hall, so be sure to stick around for that and uh, learn some, some pretty neat things. Have a blessed day. I'm not going to shake hands this morning, so be sure to greet each other as you leave. Thanks. Thank you.